to everyone. Good morning, good morning. It is a beautiful day in Texarkana, USA. My name is Bill Bullock, and some people call me the Rabbi Son, but I am here to talk to you about Parsha Tazria. This is the, uh, the fourth Parsha, the fourth section, as it were, of the book of Leviticus. Uh, we've learned to call it something else, what it was originally called, what it is intended to be, which is Sefer Vayikra, the book of calling, the book in which the Holy One calls unto us. And it is measures the, the depth, the height, the breadth, and the substance of the calling of the Holy One upon the lives of his people. That is a, a call unto him, to come to his presence, to come into his chambers, to come into his courts, to become courtiers of the kingdom of heaven, to uh, begin to uh, absorb, uh, emanate, radiate, and spread throughout the world his holiness, his kedusha, his majesty, his goodness, his attributes of mercy and compassion and faithfulness to covenant and forgiveness uh, and, and, and steadfastness to all things. So we are called into that, and we have been finding out that it is a big call. It's quite honestly, it's it's an, uh, sometimes it seems overwhelming, and yet it's it also it's exhilarating and freeing that he that the creator of the universe, who knows all generations and all human beings and designed all things, actually entrusts his kedusha, his majesty, his holiness, his goodness his attributes, his life force into us. He, he confides with us his secrets of truth. He gives to us his wisdom. He, he counsels us in how to be, have an impact upon this world that will bring about his grand plan. And as I love to tell you, his grand plan is to redeem mankind as a species, bloodline by bloodline, household by household, and individual by individual. But that's not all. Also, to restore all of created order to its original intended state of beauty, fruitfulness, and shalom and harmonious interaction as it was, as it will be again in the Garden of Eden. That's his plan. We are privileged to be called into that plan, but it requires us to step up our game a little bit. And this message today, I hope we're just talking, just friends sitting in a room uh, across this internet stage, talking to one another about what it means. What does it entail for us to, to step into his higher realm, to set the bar uh, higher, that, to become a counterculture to the world's uh, mess, to the world's perversions, to the world's corruption. To, and that's, that it spreads across all cultures. There's not one culture or one ethnicity that's worse than another or better than another. This is the human condition since the fall. And we are called to bring a level of tikkun into it. Now, when I say we are called to do that, I mean we are to play a role. In it. We are not to play the major role. That major role must be played by our king, by the creator, and by his Mashiach, his Messiah. However, in the meantime, and in the process of it, he uses us as his hands and his feet extended to be a part of bringing that grand plan into operation little bit by little bit. And so what we see is uh, in conversation by conversation, in interaction by interaction, in place to place, hill, hillside to mountain to valley to village, in times and spaces in times and spaces in location of geography, he begins to bring little foretaste of what his grand messianic kingdom will be like. The thousand years, as it's called, or the millennial reign that he begins to culminate, he intends to culminate the uh, events of uh, since the fall and bring back the Garden of Eden mentality to the earth. And it, even it will have its moments of, uh, of challenge. But now in the process, while we're here, we have to decide how we are supposed to change. We have learned, I think, uh, I don't mean to be uh, disrespectful of any religion or philosophy or ideology or any field of endeavor of man. However, I think if you look around you today, it should not come as any big shock to you that we are failing miserably at our job. 
if we are to be the counterculture that brings light to the nations and salt to the earth. Now, one of the nations that involves with the plan of redemption for mankind as a species, and salt to the earth involves his, or invokes his uh, re plan for the restoration of all of creation to its original intended state of beauty and fruitfulness and shalom. Uh, if we understand that that was our calling, that is our calling, it remains our calling, will always remain our calling. Now we are in Yeshua, we are in Messiah to do this, but nevertheless, the calling remains the same. We're a kingdom of priests, a holy nation, and I'm Segula. We are the shadow of the Almighty upon the face of the earth. We are to bring, move when he moves and do what he does and brings a, a level of, of shalom into the world where, where he does, where he comes. We're to do that, but we're not looking around and seeing it. It's not happening. So something is, is wrong. Something is wrong with our religions, all of them. Something is wrong with our philosophies, all of them. Something is wrong with our ethnocultures, all of them. Something is wrong with our economies, all of them. Something is wrong with our ideologies and our political structures, our political constructs, all of them. And now we are a minority who are called to come out of our shells, to come out of our hiding, to come out of the darkness where we have been content to dwell and step into the light. Step into the foreground. Step into the places he has assigned for us to go. And that is what it's all about. Now, where we are in the, in the context of Parsha Tazria this morning is that what I call the Emmanuel era is upon us. This is a stunning truth that there was a period of time, a prototypical period of time at Mount Sinai it, the, toward the end of the, the year of the Exodus, in, continuing into the beginning of the new year after the Exodus and all for 40 years and many years thereafter, there was a period of Emmanuel. The Holy One had us build the tabernacle, a actual physical structure uh, that was patterned after the heavenly courts and chambers. And he had us build it according to the specification and the blueprint that he gave to Moshe on the mountain. And we did so at Sinai and he filled it. He came and he, his cloud uh, overshadowed, covered the tabernacle uh, and his presence, his manifest glory, his manifestation of who he is, his goodness, his power, all of his goodness passed before us and sat and dwelt in that Mishkan. This is the period of Emmanuel. Now, this... You could say, well, that's not now. I mean, we don't see a tabernacle and we don't see a cloud and we don't feel the sense of his weight and his presence in every situation across an actual manifestation upon the earth. Well, if you, uh, uh, I will not go deep into this, but consider what the purpose of what the Christian world calls the Holy Spirit and the impartation of Pentecost or Shavuot might be for that. Isn't that basically the picture that we're being drawn here. We should be closer to that manifest presence than ever before. I'll leave that there because we need to get to Tazaria. In Parsha Tazaria, we are beginning to be introduced to some of the things that happen and must be adjusted. Our approach to them must be adjusted because of the Emmanuel era, the initiative of the Holy One to come and dwell in our midst. He, he will dwell in our midst, we are his people, he is our God, and that changes everything. And if it doesn't change everything, then we're just another philosophy, another religion, another ideology, another ecosystem, another ethnocentric culture. We are something else, but we are not the people of the living God until we understand that every facet of our life, every aspect of our existence is now changed must be changed by virtue of the presence, the indwelling, the inhabitation of the creator of the universe in our midst, whether it be in a physical temple, which there is none at this stage, or whether it be in our us as his physical temple. One way or another, heaven touches earth and we must change and we must adapt to this new environment where heaven is touching earth. Well, we saw what can happen when heaven touches earth and earth tries to resist back or do its own thing back last week with 
Parsha Shemini and the episode of Nadav and Abihu, the strange fire. The heavens touched earth. We talked in, uh, in some length about the, the Ranan uh, sound that came forth from the throats of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people probably at that time. And then how that is to be prototypical or pro, uh, prophetic of what will happen to, with the nations and B'nai Israel in the end of days, whenever Israel is restored to its place and the Messianic, Messianic kingdom comes, all the nations will run on with us. We talked in detail about how the, the multitudes fell upon their faces and surrendered their lives and their ways and their will to the presence of the Holy One because heaven had touched earth and there was an indwelling. There was a, a Emmanuel, God with us. But Nadav and Abu were our first examples of what can happen, what can go wrong. What can happen whenever we try to bring our mindsets and our ways of thinking and our history and our uh, traditions into, uh, into an environment which is supercharged with the presence of the Holy One. And so Nadav and Abihu, we saw they, they were like, they stuck their finger in an electric socket. The power that is released when heaven touches earth is incredible. The fire that is released is purifying, uh, redemptive in all its ways. But if you stick your finger in the electric socket, beloved, you will be fried. And unfortunately, you, you, you learned immediately with this whole stunning episode of Nadav and Abu that our behavior must change. Our approach to spirituality must change when the presence of the Holy One dwells among us. And if it doesn't, there will be consequences of it. It will be very severe, very difficult. Now, that was the first. That was the stunning beginning, just to tell us that story. And, and of course, it was a real story, and it was a real week. And as we see what next happened is we saw a bereavement. Obviously, Aharon and his brothers just lost their family. Elisheva, Aharon's wife, uh, the mother of these two young men that, that, that were, were caught in this fire. They also were bereaved. But now in, in the presence of the Holy One, bereavement, in the manifestation of the touching of heaven and earth, bereavement must be reviewed differently. A viewed, um, amazing. Our flesh cannot be what controls in this process. So you saw what happened with Aaron. Aaron did not stop what he was doing. He would not surrender his shalom. He, he did not uh, speak. He did not speak against the Holy One. He did not speak about the fire. He, did not, he just held his shalom. He held it. Because in the presence of the Holy One, you will hold your shalom or you will begin to walk away. You will begin to separate yourself from the presence and the majesty of the Holy One. And you will be a false witness of his presence. Now, the, uh, the next thing that happened, obviously, was that the, the Holy One began to say, now your job, Part of your function, your mission, when heaven touches earth and I call you to be my servants in this process, my counterculture, you must learn to badal, to separate out, to be a line of demarcation between the realms of the holy and the profane, or common, and the between the tahora, the, the clean or pure, as the pure as it, as it said in English, but this sense of balance, well balanced and moving forward to support the ecosystem. And on the other hand, you must separate between that realm and the realm which is uh, not well balanced, is out of balance, is emotionally distraught, is hormonally or chemically out of balance, is out of tune with the grand Shema voice of the Holy One, the resonating frequencies, slightly out of tune or greatly out of tune. That is the Tame, the unclean as it's read in English, or impure as English says, but it has nothing to do with dirt, it has nothing to do with filth, it has nothing to do with impurity, it has everything to do with balance. Are we in balance and are we in tune and resonating the pure tone and frequency of the Holy One, or are we instead pulling more from the earth than we are from the heavens? Again, heaven touches earth, we will either pull from the heavens or we will pull from the earth. We'll pull the things of the heavenly and the holy, or we'll pull the things of the earth and the impure, the common, the profane. Okay, so that's where we are. That is beginning to teach us some of the flashpoints between the spirit realm of heavenlies, which are touching earth, and the flesh realm of earth, which is now being touched by heaven. Today, we will go into two more areas. In Parsha Tazria, there are basically two issues, two subject matters that are discussed. And the first one is uh, babies. 
Where do babies come from? Someone might ask. Well, that is not as easy an answer as the biologist or the scientist may tend to want to believe. Now realize that when heaven touches earth, now ordinary, if, if heaven's not touching earth, if men are just doing what men are doing, women are doing what women are doing, children are doing what children are doing, when a child is born, there's no other people coo and call and coo and, coo and, 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 and snicker and do things, but they don't really, there's no holiness attached to that. They just, it's a natural thing. Birds do it, bees do it, all kinds of animals and the animal flesh do it. There's nothing spiritual or holy about that unless heaven touches her. When there is an era, era of Emmanuel, when the presence, abiding presence, the majesty of the Holy One is here, then every, every birth tells a story. Every human being, every child born into an era of Emmanuel should tell a tremendous story. And the, the back story is going to be tremendous. And the front story, the forward, future-looking story should be tremendous, and the present story should be tremendous. This is such an event, but whenever uh, pregnancy occurs, uh, the things that lead to pregnancy occur, sexuality, human sexuality is engaged in, uh, romance or affection between male and female are attached, all the things that lead up, this great continuum that leads to birth and reproduction in the human form, this must all be touched differently now because heaven touches earth. We must now allow Kadusha, holiness, to come into this whole spectrum of attraction, uh, romantic involvement, sexuality, uh, conception, birth, uh, but before birth, the whole issue of pregnancy, the season of pregnancy, and the growing of the, of the womb, of the womb, of the baby in the womb, and the changing of the mother's uh, body shape, and the hormonal of, uh, flood that attaches to the woman's body and also affects everyone around her. This, that, this concept of, of human reproduction and all of its spectrum from the beginning of attraction to the conclusion of birth and actually well beyond that, but we'll just leave it there for the time being for Tazria's purposes. It must be touched by holiness. Kedusha must come into it and we must not look at it like the rest of the world does. We must not look at it through fleshly eyes. We must look at it through the eyes of how does the Holy One look at each child and each backstory of that child's birth and conception? How does the Holy One look at it? And what would he want to do? Because every child's birth, conception, should be marked off with boundary lines of Kedusha. Just like we badal, the task of the Kohan, a priest as we call it in English. And we are all Kohanim, priests, according to uh, the Torah and according to the Riharasha. We all have a priesthood. Now, if we are, our, part of our job is to badal between the holy and the profane, the common and the, or the clean and the unclean, the, the abomination and the, and, and the pure, the holy, the, the perfect. If we're to make that to badal between the ra and the, 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 and the tov, good. Then if we're to do that, then we must do that with regard to every facet of our lives. And that involves especially one of the most important facets of life, which is human reproduction. When a child is born, every baby has a story. And that story needs to be marked off with boundary lines of Kedusha. And that's what Tazria's first few verses are all about. So I want to sing over you, before we read those verses, I would like to sing over you the Baruch Hu, and we'll step into this realm. Spirit to spirit communication, well beyond human intellect or reasoning or the mind. Bakura Adonai Hamvorak Baruch Adonai Hamvorak Leolam Vayet Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Bakar Banu Min Ho Ha'amin Minatan Lanu Et Toratu Baruch Ata Adonai, Natan HaTorah. Well, in chapter... The Holy One is about to tell us how to mark off the Kedusha boundary lines relative to a child's birth. 
I would encourage you to take this concept all the way, all the way, to the issue of, of uh, the events necessary to get to conception, from attraction all the way through the issue of holding hands, uh, any, any level of physical touch or affection showing, any level of intimacy, all the way through the period of pregnancy, all the way up to the birth, and then beyond the birth, what you do after birth. So these are the things I want you to do. Holiness must touch these areas, so prepare for that to happen. Chapter 12, verse 1 says this. Then the Holy One spoke to Moshe. These are the words of the creator of the universe. Divine speech, pure, unadulterated, without any interpretation, other than, unfortunately, we will read in English most of these languages, this translation from its original Hebrew. But he says to Moshe, speak to B'nai Israel, the children of Israel, as it's read in English, say, Tazria, uh, if a Tazria, if one who conceives seed, if a Tazria, a female, an Isha Tizria, has conceived and born a Zakhar, a, a male child, a child that is a remembrance. In, in Hebrew, the Zakhar is more than just a fact of, of gender. The, 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 it is the fact of Adam. It is restoring back, we're going back to the gardens. We must go back to the first man and the idea of a remembrance of Adam. So if a Kazria conceives and bore, bears a remembrance of Adam, then she shall be Tame. She is Tame for seven days. There is a season of time when she is exempt from certain things and she is under extreme emotional and hormonal flood. And she cannot be balanced during this period of time. Not in the spiritual sense that's necessary for heaven to touch earth. Unless she wants to become as Nadav and Abihu, there needs to be for her own sake. And for the sake of her family and her newborn child, there needs to be a sense of heightened awareness and heightened sensitivity. This is a time of joy, it is a time of delight, it's also a time when hormones go crazy and emotions go wild. We see people with postpartum depression, we have people who have to make a new life, especially if it's your first child, with your spouse, and adjust to a whole different way of life. Your body has just lost something that was precious to you that you drew energy from. And the Hebrew mindset, I mean, actually the, the child sustains the mother during pregnancy as opposed to the other way around. Because the child is still emanating holiness uh, and, and kedusha from heaven. And the mother is letting that kedusha. But now the child's been separated. And so the flow of kedusha into the mother has ceased, as has the flow of the mother's nutrients of earth. ceased going into this once heavenly child. So it says, if this happens to be uh, to May for seven days, a seven-day period for a zakar. As in the days of her customary uncleanness, her t t customary tuma. Now, this has not been introduced before. This is something new that says that every month, uh, with, the, with the cycle of the moon, every woman of childbearing age uh, have, goes through a process, we call it menstruation. And during that seven days of blood, as it's called, that also is an emotional uh, hormonal flood time when it, the, the balance of your of your spirit to, to, to flesh uh, level your matrix there begins to change and that is uh, un, unleavening unbalancing I should say in that process so during this time of unbalancing there needs to be a heightened awareness and an exemption from certain responsibilities in order that the person may begin to get a grip on the spiritual things and rebalance at a different level because there's now different things in play than there were before that took place. And you will, uh, we don't have time to talk in great detail about Nida. That will be much later in our discussions. But that Nida, I mean, is the period, the seven-day period of, of separation that ha takes place because of the hormonal influx that takes place during the uh, menstruation period. So he says, just as in, in the menstruation period, is there a hormonal influx, a great chemical uh, dump into the bloodstream of a woman? So is it with pregnancy. And when the termination of pregnancy by birth, uh, there will be a great hormonal influx. Now, I know this may offend the sensibilities of fleshly people throughout the world. I understand that. They may think it's sexist or genderish or whatever they may think. But if the creator of the universe says it, 
believe me, he's not sexist. And he understands life and humanity a whole lot better than scientists do and medical people do and political people and ideological men do. So if we're going to step up to this higher level, we might want to listen to what he says. And so he says, you will be unclean. She will be unclean, or as it says in English, but more to me in this state of heightened awareness uh, as in the days of her customary nida, she shall be to me. And on the eighth day, I'm going to introduce this thing called Brit Mila, or for this is a car, this male child, on the eighth day, he is to be circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And this was the covenant that the Holy One made with Avram, that every child born of his seed uh, into his household would be circumcised. This, on the eighth day, is not when you get grown, when you get older, it's, it's not a, a, a a sacrament that you do later for your own spirituality purposes. This is a part of the covenant. And when heaven touches earth, we walk according to his ways and his covenant and his wisdom. And we, we don't sit there and say, well, this isn't what we want to do. And maybe the doctors don't want to do this. This is what we do because he is our king. We are his people. We are not seeking to get something for it or, or be blessed for it. We, we're doing it because this is part of our becoming the counterculture that he ordained us to be, to bring tikkun, to bring life and light into the nations and, and see and salt into the earth. And he knows how to do it. And we think we do, but we don't until we listen to him. So it says on the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. And then the woman, she, the Tazaria, shall continue in the blood of her purification for 33 days. There is an additional 33 day period beyond the seven days after the circumcision, 33 more days, in, and when a male is born, uh, Zakar is, is reinduced into the world in the state of, of Emmanuel, when heaven is touching earth. The, and these 33 days are again times when the child, when the mother is to bond with the child and the family members, and there is to be a reestablishment of, of an order and a sequence, and this hormonal uh, flush or a rush or flood that's taken place is to find a, a place of leveling and balancing out and equivalencing during that period of time. And after that, then certain things are to be done. We're back into the uh, realm of the, uh, of the Korbanot and certain things are to be brought as a, 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 a Korban Hata'at and as a Korban uh, Ola. Now, those are going to be a pigeon or a, or a uh, uh, or our dove. It's a very small mite of an item. And you see this happened with Miriam, uh, the mother of Yeshua the, uh, of Nazareth. And this, this whole story is given to us in the Brit Hadashah. That's how it took place. Now that's the first story. The issue of human sexuality. The issue of how we do human sexuality from stem to stern all the way up to birth and beyond birth with regard to the first 30, well, 40, 40 days for a male. And we're going to find that it's 80 days for a female uh, when a female is born, whenever a haba is come into the world, the haba uh, uh, recreation or the haba remembrance comes into the earth as a female. And again, we're going back to the Garden of Eden and we want to restore, we want to do this better this time than we did last time or that the original haba and Adam did. Now, with all this being said, the second subject very briefly is marks on the skin and particularly a type a special kind of mark that applies whenever there is an Emmanuel era. In the, an Emmanuel era we are in the light of the Holy One and we will see things that will not be seen when there's not Emmanuel, Emmanuel going on. Whenever the world is living according to its own culture, its own ways, and we are not heaven touching earth in a special manifest way, you won't ever see this. You won't know what happens and, and as a result you won't be able to do anything about it. And that's the neat thing about, that's the wonderful blessing about in the times of Imam. Not some leprosy as it's called in the English language and thought of as the, to the Western world. As some form of skin disease that's caused by whatever, some sort of pathogen or an environmental situation. That is, this is not that. That is a thing of earth. The thing that we're talking about, which is in Hebrew is called zara'at, or in English so wrongly translated as leprosy, is this, this concept of what you can see in your skin 
by virtue of the grace and the mercy of the Holy One so that you can fix it and re make a, a rebalancing take place is when you are, are so out of balance inside, uh, in your thoughts, life, in your speech, particularly, very important, your speech, in your emotional makeup and your, and your willingness to uh, indulge negative emotions as well as negative speech and negative thought about your fellow man, your environment, or the Holy One himself, or even about yourself. When you in incorporate these things into your life, in the Emmanuel realm, there should be immediate signs 